Well, we can get started knowing that a couple of folks will join us. Hey everyone, welcome to our final session of CDOW's eighth annual forum. It's crazy to think that we're already at the end. Mm -hmm. So thank you all for sticking through and joining us today. We got an exciting session hosted by the Catskill Center on elevating your knowledge of the Catskill Mountains. This will be a fun interactive session and hopefully you'll take away some new things along the way. So I just wanna cover a couple of housekeeping <laughs> things before we dive in into the larger session. So my name is Kelly Knutson. I'm the state policy manager with the coalition of the Delaware River Watershed. If you do experience any technical difficulties, feel free to message me directly in the chat box. We're also gonna utilize the chat box just to throw out questions to our speakers and panelists and interact with other folks on the line as well. I will say that this session is gonna be recorded and it will be posted on our website early next week or late next week. And that way, you know, you can reference anything that you want, share it online in social media or forward it to folks that hadn't had a chance to preview it as well. So again, if you have any technical difficulties, message me. Everyone's gonna be on mute, but feel free to ask any questions in the chat box directly. Um, I will say on sketch.com under our event, you can go in and provide feedback to all the sessions that you attended and selected in attendance. So we would love to get your feedback on what went well, what you would like to see for future events and how we can improve engagement across the coalition. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to John at the Catskill Center, take it away. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you very much. Yeah, welcome. Um, I hope that everybody's enjoyed the forum this week. Uh, I know I sat in for a little bit and uh, got to hear some, get some great information about what's going on in the Delaware, Del Delaware River watershed. And um, I'm really excited to be able to do this talk today and to be able to, I guess, end the forum, hopefully on a fun note. <laughs> Uh, what we'll do is uh, we're going to have a tour of the Catskills. We're going to start at the highest elevation in the Catskills and go down in elevation continually, uh, seeing mostly rare species we're going to focus on in the way, but uh, also some more common habitats and common species, uh, some of the really pretty sites in the Catskills. Uh, the, the Catskills are a destination for recreation, uh, and this year, especially with COVID, our uh, numbers of recreationists have, have been through the roof. We've no one's ever seen any. Um, they haven't seen the numbers of people out there that we're seeing this year. So um, it's great that we can do this virtually and. Uh, you get to experience some of these places uh, without having to interact with a lot of other people. So uh, what we're going to do is uh, I'll give uh, an overview of the Catskill Center where I work. Uh, we'll talk about some of these uh, species as we go. Uh, then um, you'll need to pay attention because we have a trivia contest at the end and um, you could be a winner. So pay attention, take notes, <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, so my name is John Thompson. Uh, my preferred pronouns are he, him, his. I am the Catskill Regional Invasive Species Partnership Coordinator at the Catskill Center. Uh, usually I would be working out of Arkville in Delaware County, New York, uh, but since March, of course, we've been working from home uh, and we've been doing a lot of virtual programs like we're doing today. So hopefully this will be enjoyable and, and you'll get to learn a little bit about the cat skills. So let's see. There we go. So the Catskill Center for Conservation and Development was founded in 1969. Its mission is to protect and preserve the environmental, cultural, and economic resources of the Catskills. And today we meet that mission through inspiration by helping visitors, residents, students, and educators to connect meaningfully with the Catskills through our programs and communications, and by creating a world-class gateway for the region at the Catskill Visitor Center in Mount Tremper. Um, 
we meet that mission through collaboration. We work with a lot of regional stakeholders to achieve common goals in the Catskills. And we meet that mission through stewardship by protecting and preserving our unique natural resources and landscapes. Kelly, do the slides look okay? Are you seeing- You wanna put in a presentation mode, that'd be great. Okay, it's not in presentation mode. There you go. Perfect. How's that? Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so the cat skills actually can be defined in slightly different ways. Um, the way most people think of the cat skills is that they are defined by this blue line here. Kelly, can you see my uh, mouse when I move it? Yep, I sure can. Okay, great. And uh, so this cat skill blue line is an area of 700,000 acres. And uh, there is a large amount of protected land, uh, state owned and city owned land within the blue line, but 60% of it is privately owned. The background here are the watersheds of the Hudson River uh, shown in tan here on the east side. And in blue, we have the, the most important watershed is the Delaware River watershed that we have here. And this green star that I have marking at 4,177 feet is Slide Mountain, where we'll be starting our hike, uh, our field trip in a, in a few minutes. But this is where the Catskills are in southeastern New York. Oops. We can't really talk about the Catskills without mentioning the New York City water supply. There are six of the New York City um, reservoirs in the Catskills, uh, and those are Cannonsville, Capactan, Neversink, Rondout, Ashokan, and, and Schoharie. And they're based, for the most part, they're around the margins of the watershed, um, the New York City watershed that's shown in here in green. Uh, and that supplies the water for, well, 90% of the water for 10 million people. So it's really important water supply uh, for New York City and the metropolitan area. And it's important for the Catskills, it's important culturally, economically, and also ecologically. Let's see. Change that. Some of the major landowners that we have in the Catskills are the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, the land that they own is shown in green here. They own and manage 287,500 acres in the Catskills. And you can see it's not just within the blue line here, but it's also there's a lot of uh, parcels that are outside of the blue line, even way down to the, the Delaware River. And then the New York City Department of Environmental Protection also owns a considerable amount of land. And I have that shown in brown here. And uh, they own 156,824 acres and they're continuing to, to add uh, to their land base to protect the water supply of New York City. And again, you can see the, the uh, most of the, the Catskills uh, are in the Hudson River watershed, but there's a very large part of the Catskills within the Blue Line uh, that are within the Delaware River watershed. So what I wanted to focus on today is the biodiversity of the Catskills. And starting with the region that I work in, the Catskill Regional Invasive Species Partnership region is much larger than that blue line that I showed you. Um, we're talking about an area of 3.3 million acres in seven counties, uh, across seven counties. And in that area, we have 78 New York State rare species, and we also have uh, 22 New York State rare ecological communities. Uh, some of the most numerous uh, groups that we have are vascular plants, there's 27. 
uh, that are rare in this crisp region. Um, and there's 10 species of birds, there's 18 species of insects. Um, and we'll hit on some of the species on the right side. We'll hit on all of those species as we go through this field trip today. So another important aspect of the Catskills is that you have large contiguous forests. Most of the Catskills are forested. In the Crisp region where I work, 74% of the area is forested. Uh, and some of those forests are really large contiguous blocks. Uh, in the Northeastern United States, this is an area that has some really big contiguous forests, and you can see that on this map here, which is a map of the High Allegheny Plateau of which the Catskills is a part, and on the eastern side you see this uh, big conglomeration of these contiguous forests, and all the dark green ones are over 15,000 acres of contiguous forests, and those are, um, those are forests that don't have uh, major roads going through them and aren't largely fragmented like most of the forests that uh, we see in other parts. So we're gonna start our field trip now uh, at Slide Mountain, which again is at this green star, uh, kind of right in the middle of that blue line. Uh, Slide Mountain is the tallest mountain in the Catskills. It's 4,177 feet in elevation. And when you're there uh, on the top of Slide Mountain, you're in this mountain spruce fir forest. It's a really dense, dark forest uh, that's dominated by balsam fir, red spruce. And uh, it's really dark on the forest floor. Forest floor. Um, and it does have some other species. Like if, if you look here, you can see there's white birch. Um, that's another species that you would see uh, in the uh, spruce fir forest. And, oh, what? What's that? That's, that looks like some kind of thrush. Somebody get the binoculars on it? Hey, look at this. We can see that um, it has a partial eye ring and it has these dark splotches on its neck and its throat. Um, this is a big nose thrush. This is one of the rarest birds in North America. It only lives in these mountain, mountain uh, spruce fir forests, these mountain habitats. And uh, it's, since its habitat's really limited, then its range is really limited and its habitats are really limited where it can live. And this species, it's really important. Uh, we're on Slide Mountain and the species was first discovered and was named um, after the guy that discovered it on Slide Mountain in 1881. And that guy in 1881 uh, was Eugene Bicknell. And this is a photograph of him here. So Slide Mountain is really important ecologically. Uh, it's important historically. Uh, and it's great that we got to see this bird. That's exciting. From near Slide Mountain, um, you can get a view of some of the other peaks in the Catskills. The Catskills have 35 peaks that are over 3,500 feet. Um, there's, there are a lot of hiking groups in the Catskills, including the 3500 Club of people that, that bag all these peaks, um, that hike up to the different peaks in different seasons of the year. And, um, there are great views like this where you can look across a great expanse of the landscape and you hardly see a house or, or human habitation, but there's forested hills and mountains uh, almost as far as the eye can see. So it's great to stop here and, and take, a, uh, take this all in, um, see what the cat skills look like. And we'll continue moving down slope uh, down below 3,000 feet in elevation, um, we get patches of hemlock northern hardwood forest. And this is a really important forest type for a lot of different reasons. It's also important that at these higher elevations, we have 
first growth or old growth hemlock northern hardwood forest, the ones that weren't cut uh, when the original settlers came into the, the Catskills. Um, hemlock, you know, was prized for its bark. Uh, its bark was used to make um, tannic acid and tannins uh, were used to tan leather, uh, which was really important in the, the uh, 19th century in the 1800s. There were 75 tanneries that were in the Catskills uh, and they were spread throughout the Catskills. And, and the first roads pretty much were uh, these wagon roads that were to come up into some of these stands of hemlocks. At higher elevations, the stands that were less accessible, those were never cut for the tan bark industry or for any other industry. So we have uh, over 30 old growth hemlock stands and the Catskills and altogether there's over 65,000 acres of, of old growth uh, or first growth and the Catskills, uh, trees that weren't cut over time. So these hemlock forests are, are important for a lot of different reasons. I mean this one here we're looking at is important because it's old growth, but it's also important because hemlocks support uh, a number of different bird species. There are a number of birds that we found uh, to have an affinity for hemlock forests, uh, such as black burning and warbler, uh, this black throated green warbler, winter wrens. Most of the hemlock forests that we have in the Catskills aren't uh, at higher elevation like this, but they're down in the ravines and the cloves uh, along the kills of, of the Catskill. Uh, so unfortunately, um, we watch these hemlocks very closely. And if you get your hand lens out and take a look at some of the branchlets of, of the hemlocks, uh, what you could see when you turn the boughs over and, and look underneath the, the needles, um, sometimes what you can see are these white cottony masses, which you guys are probably all familiar with. That's the hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, it first came into this area in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, hemlock woolly adelgid, uh, this uh, species or variant of, of adelgid is from Japan. And uh, they first started to show up, as I said, in, in the late 80s, early 90s, in the Catskills, and have eventually spread throughout almost all the stands of the Catskills that we know of. And uh, this species works to suck the sap out of the base of the needles of the hemlock. The hemlocks try to protect themselves by, by closing that vascular tissue off. Eventually, the needles will dry out and, and be shed over time. Um, in some areas in the southeastern United States, there are hemlock stands uh, and hemlock trees themselves that will die over four or ten years. Uh, here in the Catskills, they've held on. Um, there are some stands, at least, that have held on for much longer than that. We're monitoring these hemlocks and working with the New York State Hemlock Initiative uh, to release biocontrol in some of our hemlock stands. Uh, that have enough adelgid to support some of the biocontrols. Uh, and what we hope is that over time, those biocontrols will be able to control the hemlock woolly adelgid. And there are a number of organizations that are working to use insecticides against the hemlock woolly adelgid, and, and those are, are effective in controlling the adelgids so that that one invasive species uh, isn't completely decimating our hemlock stands. So, hey, we got a nice view here. Let's walk out and see what we can see. But, whoa, watch your step though. That's a timber rattlesnake. That's one of the, the two poisonous snakes that we have in the Catskills. Um, you can identify a timber rattlesnake by its triangular head. Usually they have a, a pretty fat body. Uh, and we have a number of densites or hibernacula in the Catskills. And for the most part, um, the snakes will stay around those hibernacula. They'll, they'll migrate out to basking areas. 
Um, but some of the males might venture four and a half or five miles away from the den sites. Uh, these species are working to control uh, rodents and small mammals that are here in the Catskills. Um, and there are a number of uh, different uh, hibernacula that we have in the Catskills, as I mentioned. And the hibernacula themselves um, are usually cracks or fissures that the snakes can get down to that are below the frost line. And they need those hibernacula in order to overwinter. Um, so those, that part of their habitat's limited uh, and the, the number of snakes and the number of den sites is, is limited. So we don't see a lot of, of rattlesnakes in the Catskills, but we do have a, a number of den sites and that's another uh, threatened and rare species in, in New York State, the timber rattlesnake. So next we're going to continue to go down in elevation. Um, we're going down to Catterskill Falls here. Um, we're standing on the, the platform. You can look out, you can see the falls. Um, there's a little piddle of water coming off and it's dropping down into the pool here. And you can see that this waterfall and, and um, a lot of the waterfalls have some amount of cliff line around them usually and those cliffs themselves have a lot of habitats, um, a lot of micro habitats uh, that make it possible for a number of different species to live there. Like the, the fragrant cliff fern that you see here is on a lot of, is on some of the cliffs of, of the Catskills. Um, that's species uh, that we found, um, not necessarily right here at Catterskill Falls. Um, and the common rose root is, is another species uh, that we have in the Catskills that lives in some uh, of habitats that are similar to this. Even close to Catterskills Falls, uh, you can find cliff nesting bird species like the peregrine falcon. And Catterskill Falls and the Catskills themselves have been an inspiration for poets and artists for hundreds of years. Uh, the Hudson River School, which you're probably familiar with, was the first major art movement in the United States. Um, it started in 1825, and there were about 100 artists that were involved up to about 1875. It was started by Thomas Cole in the Hudson Valley. Uh, he went out and painted landscapes, and they had this romantic romanticized ideal about the American landscape. And what it came to symbolize is this romanticized American landscape of nature um, came to equal the American identity that people were inspired to see the, these paintings um, and to look at the American landscape in a different way, that it wasn't just a resource to take things from, but it was a, a resource that you could, you could appreciate, take pride from, um, actually helped to give us an identity. So there's a number of these sites that you can actually go back to that, that were painted in the 1800s and they're still there and you can look at them today and you can see that because the lands to a large part protected, uh, these landscapes are protected and, and you can actually go out to some of the sites where Thomas Cole was um, and some of the other painters were and see the actual cliffs, the boulders, the mountains that they were painting at that time. And you can see how they've changed from then till now uh, to a large degree by looking at their paintings. So now we're gonna drop down further in elevation uh, and um, we'll, by looking along the edge of this uh, stream here, um, we're looking for another New York State rare species and one that's on the federal endangered species list. Uh, and that's the northern monk's hood. It's a species that has uh, these hood-shaped flowers. Uh, they're about an inch uh, wide, 
And there's usually a number of them along the stems of the plant. Uh, they have a highly dissected leaf. Uh, and you'll find them in these habitats of, of ravines along streams. You'll also find them near ice caves or areas of talus where there's cold air drainage. So the Catskills, as we're, we're going to see uh, as we continue to go down in elevation, uh, we'll see that uh, the Catskills have very clean waters. Uh, we have a lot of forests. Uh, and that helps to support the biodiversity that they have and um, that we have in the Catskills and, and also helps to su uh, support um, clean water and uh, a lot of the resources that, that we depend on for our lives and, and uh, for our economy and uh, for the well being of us. So, continuing to go down in elevation, uh, now we're at the Never Sink. Uh, river. Uh, this is south of the blue line. Uh, if we look down in this stream, uh, we can find the dwarf wedge mussel. Uh, there's a, uh, at one point, there was a very large population of dwarf wedge mussels in the Never Sink. It's a species that lives on these firm um, stream bottoms that are gravelly. But stream bottoms of streams that aren't polluted, that don't have a lot of sediment, uh, and they, they've lived here and they've been studied here for, well, they first were discovered here in the 90s and they was studied here over the last few decades. Um, and as I said, uh, this has been a, a very large population of the dwarf wedge mussel. It's another example of a state rare species uh, that lives here in the Catskills. And there are a, a number of other uh, mussels that occur in Catskill streams, as, as you're probably all aware of. So our next stop uh, will be on one of the Catskill Center properties. And uh, I want to just chat about the Catskill Center's stewardship function. Um, we function as a land trust. We're actually accredited by the land trust um, uh, accreditation. Um, we have two uh, preserves that we own, um, the Platt Clove and the Thorn Preserve. Both are open to the public. We also manage the Catskill Visitor Center lands. There's about 60 acres there. Uh, the ERP Center is in Arkville, and that's our main headquarters. We have 18 easements that total over 2,500 acres. Uh, we have also, over our, um, since our beginning in, in 1969, 51 years ago, uh, we also have acquired a number of properties and transferred them to New York State so that they would be protected as state lands. Uh, right now, we're not actively soliciting fee lands or easements, but um, we are involved in easements in special circumstances. Uh, so this map on the right, um, you can see uh, the Catskill Center's easements. Uh, you can also see in, that are in the green dots, and in blue are the Catskill Center properties um, that are uh, here, for the most part, in the eastern part of the Catskills. And then the, the pink is the New York City watershed. Uh, and the blue line is there, as I mentioned. Then we're going to go to the Catskill Center Preserve that's called the Thorn Preserve in Woodstock. That will be our next stop, and uh, that will be our, our lowest elevation stop. It's at about 420 feet elevation. Uh, this is one of the most painted views of Overlook Mountain uh, in, in the Catskills. Uh, and there's, you, there's no reason to wonder why here. It's a great landscape that has 60 acres of meadows. Um, it's surrounded by floodplain forests for the most part, and it's along the Sawkill Stream. And in those meadows of the Thorn Preserve, uh, we have bobolinks that are breeding and uh, other species uh, such as the American woodcock 
that you'll see there in courtship in the spring. And there's butterflies uh, such as the Baltimore checker spot. Uh, there's lots of odinates, dragonflies, and damselflies that we have in the pond and along the stream. It's a beautiful landscape. Um, it's one that we're protecting or ma maintaining as open fields. Uh, these open field habitats are some of the fastest declining habitats in the northeastern United States. And uh, because of that, grassland bird species are declining. You take something like the bobolink requires at least a, a field of at least 25 acres um, to have enough nesting habitat to be able to breed. Uh, so it's important that we keep some of these uh, meadows open and that's what we're trying to do here at the Thorn Preserve. Um, as I said, it's open to the public. We have walking trails there um, and uh, there are a lot of education programs that we do there. And we also are trying to keep track of the biodiversity through a bio blitz that we've held there and through citizen science uh, that we have going on there. So with that, that ends our field trip. Uh, I did want to just mention that uh, the Catskills are really important for a lot of different reasons, as I, I hope we've illustrated through this field trip. Um, it's important because of its ecology, uh, from the number of species that it supports to the large contiguous forests. It's important uh, for the economy of our region. Uh, there's a lot of tourism that's attracted to the Catskills because of the natural beauty that we have here. And as I mentioned, the visitation of the Catskills has been increasing uh, this year, especially. Uh, and it's a place that's been inspiring to us for uh, several hundred years and, and, and longer even if you talk about the first Americans and the indigenous people that lived here. So I hope that you've enjoyed this tour through the Catskills. Um, here's my contact information here if anybody would like to contact me. Um, my, my information is here. If anybody has any questions, what we're gonna end this with is doing a trivia contest. So hopefully you remembered all of the information that I gave you. There might even be questions on there that I didn't even tell you what the answers are. <laughs> we'll see. Um, so Kelly, do you wanna get that set up? Did sure, I'm gonna launch the first question if that's all right. Okay. Okay. So the first question is, and all of these are going to be multiple choice, so there's no reason why uh, you can't at least take a guess at them. Um, but the first question is, how much area is covered by the Catskill Blue Line? Um, is it 500,000 acres, 700,000 acres, 1 million acres, or 6 million acres? And again, we're talking about the cat skills. We're not talking about the Adirondacks here. So. so we'll give people a few seconds to, to answer that. All right, I'm going to end poll and share the results. Yep, thank you. Okay, so almost everybody got the question right. It's 700,000 acres are within the Catskill Blue Line. Uh, so good job. <laughs> Let's go to the next question, Kelly. Sure. So the next question should be, yep. uh, what is the tallest mountain in the Catskills? And the Answers are either Hunter, Cornell, Thomas Cole, or Slide. All right, I'm gonna like end the, and share. 
everybody got that one right. That's great. <laughs> they took notes. <laughs> Good job, everybody. Okay. Oh, third question. This is um this one's a little bit harder. Um, how many peaks are over thirty five hundred feet in the Catskills? Um, and there's uh, by by in the Catskills, I mean not just within the blue line, but also includes outside of the blue line. So, so I am going to end and share. Okay. Most everybody got that one right, right? That was a little bit harder. Uh, that was uh, that there are 3,500 peaks that are over 3,500 feet in the Catskills. And there's actually 33 that are, are within the blue line. And there's two of them that are outside of the blue line. Next question is, how many New York City, oop, looks like we get a spelling error. <laughs> how many New York City reservoirs are in the Catskills? And we had a slide where we went over all of those. And again, the uh, uh, so the Catskills are, are providing drinking water, uh, about 90% of the drinking water for about 10 million people in the New York City metropolitan area. So it's really important that we uh, keep these large unfragmented habitats and uh, that we are protecting that water supply. Everyone seems to have their votes in, so I'm going to end and share. Yeah, most people got that one right, too. That's good. It's six. There are six uh, New York City reservoirs uh, in the Catskills area. So the next question is uh, Eugene Blackwell. Oh, Eugene Bicknell is credited with discovering the Bicknell's thrush in 1881. On which Catskills peak did he find the first, what became known as the Big Nels Thrush? All right, I'm going to end and share. Yeah, most people got this one right. Uh, it is Slide Mountain. Uh, that's where um, Eugene Bicknell first collected uh, what became known as the Bicknell's thrush. So next question. And I don't think I mentioned this, so <laughs> you'll probably have to guess. Um, but how tall is Catterskill Falls? That's the falls that I, I showed you. Um, it's in two tiers. We actually saw a couple different views of it. Um, one was a photograph uh, of the upper falls, and then there's a lower falls. And, and this number includes a combination of the upper falls and the lower falls. And the hint is that it's one of the, the tallest uh, waterfalls in New York State. Got 50% of votes in. I feel like folks don't know about this one. Yeah, <laughs> you can guess. What do we got to lose? <laughs> <laughs> no Except worries. for your reputation, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to end poll and share. Actually, more people got this right than, than wrong. It is 231 feet, and I meant to mention that. I don't think I did. Um, but yeah, it, it's a, the um, Counterskill Falls is a great destination. Actually, it's, a, it's an area where it's overvisited. It's loved to death. Um, there's a lot of issues there with visitation. Uh, this year, there's, there have been a lot of issues with litter in the area. Um, the Catskill Center has a Catskill Stewards program where we have stewards uh, at different places in the Catskills, including the Blue Hole, including Catterskill Falls, Platte Clove, uh, 
where we are interpreting uh, to people about Leave No Trace, uh, about the, the beauty of the cat skills and how best to take care of it. So uh, the, the Catterskill Falls is a, is a really important place in the cat skills. So um, what entity manages manages the most land in the Catskills. Um, so this is the, the largest landowner in the Catskills. Uh, I did have this on one of my slides. So uh, you did have the information at one point. <laughs> um, so it's either New York City Department of Environmental Protection, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation, or the Catskill Center for Conservation and Development. Looks like people are a little more hesitant here, Kelly. They definitely are. Understanding, it's like you, those on the little slide that you shared, but I'm gonna end with poll and share the results. Yep, well, more people have got this right than wrong. This is a, uh, a little bit more difficult um, but it is the, the state of New York and the New York State Department of, Con of Environmental Conservation that owns more land than any other organization in the Catskills. So uh, the next one um, is a question about timber rattlesnakes that we saw. Uh, timber rattlesnakes, how far might one move from their hibernacula or their den site? And um, with rattlesnakes, the males move farther than the females. The females are more likely to stay close to the den sites. Um, but the den sites are, as I mentioned, a really important part of their habitat. Um, they need a place to get below the frost line in the winter. Um, they also need to have basking areas, and the males will move a little further from the den site than the females. Um, so someone could uh, come up with a different answer than me, but um, my answer for this is four and a half miles, four and a half or five miles. Um, it's about the, the limit of, of how far a rattlesnake in the cat skills might move um, from the den sites. And as I mentioned, those are those would be the males and the females would stay a lot closer. Uh, probably the other people, one and a half or two miles would be, would be right for the females. So this is one uh, I did mention. Um, I'm not sure if you caught it or not, a really important one. What percentage of the area within the Catskills Blue Line is privately owned? Is it 50%, 60%, 70%, 90 percent? So there is uh, people live in the Catskills and, and so um, there's a lot of questions about what the what being within the blue line means and what what the, the phrase the Catskill Park means um, but obviously there's people that live there so people are a part of the Catskill Park uh, and we have uh, organizations that that are based out of of the cat skills within the blue line we have we have people living there year-round and people having second homes so looks like you ended it kelly <laughs> so um the answer this one uh the answer is actually 60 percent uh so um more people got this wrong than right but 50 percent is close so good enough <laughs> I'm going to launch the last question. Yeah, the last and final question. This is a hard one. I hope people took notes. Um, what makes the Catskill Mountain so special? Is it its natural beauty, high biological diversity, large number of recreational opportunities, or D, all of the above? Wow, we got some smart people out there, Kelly. <laughs> I agree. I'll end poll and share. Awesome. Thank you all. You did a good job. That That's tough.
the end of a day, the end of a forum to, to be put to the test and, and have to answer all these quiz questions. Um, that's a good job by all of you. So I appreciate everybody for tuning in. Um, this has been fun for me and fun for you, I hope. And uh, hopefully when we can actually see each other in person, um, you'll come and visit us in the Catskills. Uh, and um, I hope to see you out there at some point. Um, but but thank you for for tuning in, and thank you have, for helping out. We have one question for you if you if you have time. Oh yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. The question is from Pre, and they ask, "How are you guys approaching the managing of visitors and signage now that there has been an increase? Are you having any issues with increased trash, compact soils, trails, etc.? Which you kind of addressed, but feel free to chime in." Oh yeah, so. There's a couple things. That's a really good question. Um, and there's a couple aspects to that. Um, one of them, as I mentioned, the numbers of recreationists out there, and we, we don't have a really, we don't have uh, trail counters out at all of our trailheads. Um, we're not doing car counts. We're not doing it quantitatively. Um, but from rangers that have been around a long time, people that have lived in the Catskills a long time, no one has seen the number of recreationists that we've seen in the last few months since COVID. People um, wanted to get out of the house. Um, a lot of people have second homes in the Catskills. New York City is only 100 miles away, so it, it's an easy commute to come up to the Catskills to enjoy the outdoors. So we're seeing a lot of um, a lot more people, and we think that we're seeing people, different people, and that um, we've seen a lot more litter this year, and I, I know um, across New York State, I, I know this has been a problem in the Adirondacks, and, and I think even nationwide, and, and probably a number of you um, are experiences, experiencing this too, but the, there's been a large um, increase in the amount of litter uh, that we are seeing out there in a place that's heavily visited, like Catterskill Falls, or what we call the Blue Hole. Um, um, we, we are getting more litter and we, we have our Catskill stewards out there picking it up. Um, so we know that there are more bags of litter that are out there and coming in. And uh, what we are also seeing is that there are a number of peaks in the Catskills that are trailless peaks. Um, they don't have a trail that go to the summit. And uh, so the way that it's worked in the past is people have kind of found their own way, but now it, with GPS and phones, um, they're finding the, their way more and more often along common paths. So they're getting, they're creating these braided trails uh, in these uh, trailless peaks. Um, so we're seeing more erosion. Um, there are some that could, could cause impact to, to some of the rare species that we have and some of the more common species uh, if we're seeing more trampling uh, at some of these peaks. But yeah, that, that was a really good question and it is something that we're seeing uh, throughout the Catskills. And, and the way that we're, I think this was part of the question, but one way that we're dealing with it is, is by the, the Catskill stewards that are out at trailheads and, and talking to people about um, the importance of the cat skills and, and the importance of, of uh, abiding by leave no trace principles and staying on trails. Um, and um, we, I wouldn't say that we've necessarily, that we have more signage or anything like that. But um, one thing that we've done and we did it at the Blue Hole was, uh, and the Blue Hole um, is a stream uh, that has this swimming hole in it. Um, it was known by the locals for decades, uh, very little visited. But um, a few years back, a number of people started um, just showing up at the, at the Blue Hole. And it's an area that, that, that's in uh, the Catskill Forest. Uh, it's an area that is just this really small, sensitive stream that has this pool and people were showing up there with radios, um, with glass bottles, with um, barbecue grills and just hanging out. And you had like 700 or a thousand people that just showed up at this 
pool. And, and uh, why they were there is that through social media, they were communicating with each other that this is a great place to go in the Catskills, there's nobody there. Um, but by sharing that around, there came to be people that were there. Um, and by using social media uh, and finding out, first finding out who the people were that were coming and then finding out how they were learning about it and then reaching out to that community in New York City, specifically to tell them about um, the importance of protecting this area. What they ended up doing was creating a permit system so that they didn't get it, get this area overrun uh, by people. Uh, so um, that was one of the strategies and the Catskill stewards are there on um, the weekend and throughout most of the week. So that might have been a little longer than that person <laughs> wanted on that answer, but yeah, that was a really good question. No, pre-types in the chat box. Thank you. Very insightful. So that answered it. We do have a, about a minute or two for other questions if folks have any, if they want to unmute themselves or chat in the box, feel free to ask anything to John. I guess I can stop sharing. Do we have any other questions? John, I love this. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Sherry. <laughs> yeah, thanks for inviting me to do it. it, it it's been fun. Um, and actually, um, I mentioned it, I think, but um, I mostly focus on invasive species. And, and with this talk, the focus is, is on the things that we're trying to protect. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, for me, that's inspiring. And um, I, I really like the putting this together and uh, sharing it with all of you. It was great. I appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I second that. That was, I was not expecting it. Gone <laughs> <laughs> for years and like this was, I mean, I think that was a great way to end, end this and to learn so much about up here and how lucky we are to the photo, the transition from the painting to the photo. It looks exactly the same. We're so lucky. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah, it's that's, mm-hmm. Yep, it's amazing. Thank you, John. I concur with everyone else. This was fantastic. <laughs> I wish I was in the Catskills right now, absorbing and taking it all in. But what a way to end, like Jessica mentioned. And thank you all for your time and support. This is being recorded. We'll post it online. If others couldn't make it, you know, feel free to send it out to those and make sure <laughs> they learn all about the Catskills that John had to teach us. But thank you all again so much for joining us for this session, but also for the whole entire forum. It's been an incredible event. Amy, our event coordinator, is on the line here. Um, but thank you all from the bottom of our heart. We'd love your feedback as well. So feel free to fill out that survey that I dropped in the chat box as well. And we can always improve and make this event and engagement better and better. But thank you all again. And can't wait to see you all on the watershed, on the trails, hopefully sometime soon. Same here. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, John. Take Thanks, care. Kelly.